Video games as a form of art and entertainment are in a bit of an odd spot at the moment. Gaming is increasingly popular with nearly all generations and remains the single largest form of entertainment across the globe. At the same time, the actual games themselves and the broader industry that makes them have begun to alter and become something much different from their past versions of yester decades. While nostalgia is always a factor, to any longtime gamer enthusiast, there has been a subtle yet certain decline in the quality of games and the manner they're made. To briefly summarize the core issue, the games industry has, by and large, shifted its priorities solely towards the brazen monetization and profiteering off of video games, all at the cost of those who make them and the games themselves. To talk about this gross corporatization of gaming writ large, it's important to discuss how video games as a product have changed over the decades. In the ancient days of the 1980s, games were all one-and-done products. A title would be shipped out for the NES or Sega Genesis, any and all content and bugs were there to stay, and that was that. Games had only their own merits to sell them, and the transaction between developer and player would begin and end at the point of sale. To get a game to sell, to ultimately make money off of it, the game itself just had to be good, had to be worthwhile and provide something to the player. Though imperfect, there was a mutually beneficial relationship between developer and player. The gaming cream would rise to the top because it had to be that way, and gamers would generally recognize and reward quality. However, this relationship would fundamentally change as the world became increasingly connected to the internet. For players, patches and updates for games would soon become the norm. Any errors, bugs, or unforeseen issues could be spotted by the player base, relayed to the devs, and ironed out post-launch. For the developers, methods of further monetizing games like with DLCs and microtransactions would be widely introduced and allow for further revenue off of a game. Developers and players would now maintain a relationship post-purchase. Developers continue to maintain and add to games, and players would pay and reward them for this work. It worked for a time. Games could be updated and made even better, even if you had a few flagrant efforts to monetize a game post-launch. In time, however, developers, and more specifically publishers, began to fully appreciate and rely upon the sheer profitability of rampant monetization. You begin to see more and more content paywalled behind DLCs and microtransactions. A full experience would no longer come with the $60 price tag. In parallel, you'd see the growth of highly exploitative game mechanics like loot boxes and gacha, monetization systems as profitable as they are addictive. To call this piecemeal sale of games and integration of pseudo-gambling unpopular would be a criminal understatement. The outrage surrounding these systems has been constant and fierce, but the publishers shoving these egregious monetization systems into every game they own have no intent to relent now. Such systems may actively worsen the overall experience of gaming, but profits for the gaming industry have soared thanks to them. As a result, over the past few years you've seen an increasing priority on simply making money off of video games whether or not it's done in an earnest, ethical, or quality manner. This leads us to the most recent events in game publishers' efforts to profiteer, mass layoffs and studio closures throughout the games industry. Layoffs are a business move that don't actually work, but allow for very short-term cost reductions and shift the consequences of managerial incompetence onto the actual workers. While the past few years under the lockdown saw massive growth throughout the games industry, that growth has begun to slow down. It's still growing, mind you, just not as fast as previous years. For shareholders and executives, who are only satisfied at the sight of constant, exponential growth, they see this minor deceleration as critical, lethal, even. They happily fattened and enriched themselves whilst the goings were good, but now as things ever so slightly slowed down, they've opted for the most tasteless response in just laying off thousands. While disappointing, this isn't exactly surprising. The major publishers from Nintendo and Sony to Microsoft and Ubisoft have never been known for competent management of their workforces and sub-studios. With Microsoft and Xbox, however, the recent rationales for their layoffs and studio closures not only take the cake, but perfectly illustrate the mindset these publishers are now operating under. The air example is that of Arkane Austin and Tango Gameworks, studios with a number of respected, renowned, and undoubtedly profitable titles under their belt. With Arcane, their latest title in Redfall was a definite flop, though it was a title none of the devs wanted to make, merely being foisted on them by their parent company. While it's kinda ridiculous Arcane Austin was killed off for a singular failure, there was at least a failure that could be pointed to for its closure. The same can't be said for Tango Gameworks. Last year's Hi-Fi Rush from them was a surprise hit, being received incredibly well by gamers and critics alike. 
This was all done on a new IP and with zero marketing budget for the game either. Its popularity and praise was entirely organic and contingent on the game's many merits. In spite of this, the game wasn't profitable or successful enough to Microsoft. You can look at reports from April of last year where they discuss how it didn't meet the detached expectations set for it. Again, you wouldn't exactly expect the game to be a multi-million seller when it wasn't even advertised and put day one on Game Pass. Nonetheless, Hi-Fi Rush's modest success and huge potential was instead seen as some unsalvageable failure, and grounds for the studio behind it to be axed. To add insult to injury, a mere 24 hours after killing off numerous quality studios, the head of Xbox claimed they need smaller games that give them prestige and awards. Suffice to say, such a desire either rings hollow or is simply delusional when Xbox kills off the studios that do just that. Rather, this claim of wanting actual quality games serves to provide a thin veneer of legitimacy to Microsoft as a games publisher. It maintains the falsity that they're still focused on producing games when their priorities are now solely on growth and profitability. Now, this isn't anything groundbreaking or revelatory. Since the beginning, games have been produced to generate profits for developers and publishers. I'm not denying that. What has changed, however, are the sheer links these companies will go to to profiteer off their titles, how much they will sacrifice and abandon to see year-over-year -year growth. As technology has advanced and ever more sophisticated monetization systems have been developed, there's been less and less need to actually deliver quality to turn profits. In other words, the sub-requirement of making an actually good game to make money is less and less the case. You can just shove microtransactions and live service garbage into an established IP, and enough teenagers and consumer drones will still hand you a successful game, at least in the eyes of shareholders. To this end, a sincere focus on smaller, award-winning titles, aka games from 20 years ago, is unlikely going forward. Such games simply won't be profitable enough, and thus shouldn't be expected. But that begs the question, what should be? The long arc of the gaming industry has bent towards greater profit maximization really since its inception, and the tools which have allowed for this will simply be further refined and implemented. At present, the primary monetization tools at publishers' disposal have been live service systems to encourage microtransactions, along with loot box and gotcha mechanics. For the prior, it's all about cultivating engagement with a game, meaningful or hollow, it doesn't really matter, through frequent content patches and updates. This is all done so the game can keep the player leashed to it, to provide a gameplay loop that is just entertaining enough to keep them contentedly playing, though without feeling a full satisfaction with the game or experience. This gives ample opportunity to bombard the player with cosmetics and trinkets they may wish to purchase, along with all the cool loot they could get by just buying the season pass. The core goal is to instill in the player the belief that actual in-game enjoyment is just a credit card swipe away, and once they've made that purchase and the sunk cost fallacy kicks in, you're golden. Regarding loot boxes and gotcha, it's just about cultivating a gambling addiction. These mechanics have been refined to be about as addictive as possible, and it's something I go in-depth on in another video of mine. The rewards offered through these thinly-veiled gambling mechanisms often pertain to progression or providing a competitive edge, ranging from buffs in equipment to scantily clad anime chicks with broken abilities. Fundamentally, these systems are antagonistic towards the actual player. Content, features, and options that were once standard additions have been cut up and sold at a premium, with the purchase being the only way you can have a semi-decent experience with a game. This antagonistic game design is sure to become ever more commonplace and integral to games moving forward, all because it makes a lot of money. While these systems explicitly worsen the actual experience of gaming, to the executives and shareholders behind them, such issues are wholly overshadowed by their sheer profitability. Aside from the slow, steady spread of these gross monetization systems, publishers and developers are becoming increasingly brazen in their manner of profiteering, namely through their wanton raising of prices. Now, inflation is a thing, the budget for producing AAA titles is ever-increasing, and the consumer costs of games and consoles relative to their 20th century counterparts are generally cheaper. While I understand the need to raise prices where appropriate, the price and manner in which games are now being sold is ridiculous. A prime example of this is the pricing structure for the recently announced Star Wars Outlaws. $70 for the base game, $110 for that plus the planned expansions, and $130 for all that plus some cosmetics in an art book. To put it in more blunt terms, it's $70 for part of the game, then $110 or more for the full experience. It's a similar case with DLCs, cosmetics, and microtransactions. You're now spending the price of the base game for a few alternate skins, or $80 for a Gorilla Fist. 
While such prices are, frankly, insulting, these publishers only set them so high because they think, if not know, they can get away with them. Gaming is now a leviathan industry with a gargantuan audience. There are more than enough low-information consumers and dipshit gamers who will shell out for these overpriced games and obscene macro transactions. The fact such content still sells at such ridiculous prices justifies these rates in the eyes of publishers, and if anything, encourages them to continue raising prices just to see how far they can build consumers. The ever-increasing price gouging seen in the games industry is not the only area they intend to use to profiteer. One of the more, frankly, gross systems currently being considered is in-game advertising. Advertising and crossovers in video games are nothing new. In many cases, it's just simple marketing for the game's own store, or something relatively unobtrusive. What Sony and Microsoft have been working on, however, would see more general advertisements unobtrusively inserted into games. At present, the basic idea would be to sell in-game advertising space to any company trying to advertise, with the actual adverts being things like billboards in racing games or banners in sports games. A related system would be opt-in or occasional pop-up ads, again for any product from any company, with in-game awards attached to watching them. These advertising systems are currently being floated for use in various free-to-play games offered by Sony and Microsoft, a means of generating revenue to cover the cost of an ostensibly free game. In and of itself, these systems aren't particularly objectionable. At worst, they may hamper immersion in certain games, whilst perhaps offsetting the need for other microtransactions in them. The issue is that this is just the first iteration of actual in-game advertisement. If successful, such systems will only see further implementation and integration. Banners for Coke or McDonald's will find their way into single-player and or fully-priced games. The opt-in ads will soon become mandatory and your only release from them will be by purchasing the Battle Pass or some new subscription. Now, it's worth noting in-game advertising, as it has been previously implemented, has faced some backlash from gamers. In 2020, EA Sports UFC 4, an MMA game with stellar box art, introduced rather-in-your-face in-game advertising post-launch. The fact we were being bombarded with advertisements in a fully-priced title generates significant outrage towards the game, ultimately leading to its advertising features being pared back. While EA's decision to reverse course was the right one, their error was only in going too far, too fast. These publishers will introduce minor, unobtrusive advertising systems gamers deem tolerable, and in time they'll be seen as acceptable or the norm in games. Once a sufficiently receptive audience has been cultivated, publishers will just drop the facade and add their original, egregious monetization systems. The frog will be successfully boiled. Ultimately, such in-game advertising is set to be yet another system broadly implemented, yet wholly at odds with the actual soul of games, and all for another 30 pieces of silver. Finally, the types and sorts of games to be emphasized moving forward are those that will be most conducive towards these profitable monetization systems. Short-term growth and ever-increasing stock value are now a singular, myopic focus for these major publishers. As discussed earlier, we've seen studios of significant pedigree be axed over their failure to be obscenely profitable. Their owners aren't even interested in wasting time and resources on anything but the finest cash cows. To that end, more and more of the AAA gaming landscape is set to become annual or semi-annual live service garbage, sustained mostly off of whales and people with more money than taste. Utter schlock like COD and Battlefield, the yearly semi-functional sports titles, and RPGs insultingly ridden with microtransactions will become more and more the focus, and more and more the norm. Any aspect of a game that can be monetized will be. Every system that introduces monetization will slowly become more and more gross and intrusive. The pathological need for eternal growth, no matter how unsustainable it may be, is the motive force for nearly every major game publisher now, and the sacrifice of any and all quality in their titles is now deemed acceptable. A knock-on effect of this hyper-focus on profiteering is that game developers, the people who actually make the executives and shareholders any money, are increasingly wary of and uninterested in AAA development. I mentioned in the beginning that Redfall from Arkane Austin was a flop. This was due to the fact the development of a live-service money-first title was mandated to them, yes, but also because over half the development team left the studio rather than work on trash. Knowing that all a developer will have to work on are soulless Skinner boxes masquerading as games, and that even the delivery of actual quality acclaimed titles isn't enough to maintain job security, well, they're unlikely to stick around and find out. These major publishers have not one iota of respect for the talent and artistry that goes into making games, and if they're creating an environment that won't attract meaningful talent, then you just have a vicious cycle of rapidly declining quality. 
To shore up the holes in developer manpower, publishers will likely employ AI for use in game development, but at that point, whatever soul remaining in the games industry will be truly choked, dead, and buried. In summary, the hyper-focus on profitability and growth seen in various major game developers has progressed to a point where all pretense must be dropped and all fat trimmed. Employees and groups insufficiently profitable must be shed. Titles that don't shamelessly target players' wallets must be cancelled. And every last mechanism for monetization of microtransactions must be pursued, no matter the actual impact on consumers or the final product. Just like many of the other industries in our society and economy, the gaming industry's one goal in God is now mammon. And in time, everything that once made gaming so unique and enjoyable will be sacrificed to it. While there remain certain studios and publishers who aren't as myopically focused on money, the general downtrend in the games industry inspires little hope and is just disappointing more than anything. With that, this is an issue primarily affecting the largest players in the industry. The AAA sphere may be irredeemably corporate at this point, but the same can't be said for the indie scene. Indie developers basically carry the soul of the industry at this point, and are now the more reliable source for actual quality in gaming. While indies are definitely made to make money, by virtue of their size along with the greater creative freedom and passion, the odds of getting earnest and actually enjoyable experiences from them are immeasurably higher than anything AAA nowadays. Aside from indies, you have the titles of yester decades as well. A vast and curated library of retro games is always at the avail, and the titles at hand were made when developers at least tried to care about the games they made. With that, the overall direction of the overall industry remains bleak. Barring some mass unionization drive at major studios or an actually effective consumer protest, I feel the only real move is to check out. Better forms of gaming and better uses of one's time exist. Best not to waste your time and energy on an industry that actively despises you and the people who make it up. Hey, thanks for reaching the end, and I hope you enjoyed this vid. While I've covered the general decline of gaming and the positive scene of the indie scene previously, the ever-increasing corporatization and hollowing out of gaming was something I wanted to look at. The recent round of studio closures and egregious monetization systems on the horizon were the catalyst for this vid. They just cemented the rapid downward trend and utter soullessness of the industry in my mind. Time will only tell what its ultimate fate will be, but I've yet to be given much reason for optimism on this matter. With that, punch the like, have a couple brewskis with the subscribe button, and that bell. Until next time, take care.